Welcome to the COVID-19 Physician Learning Series, brought to you by Juul and the Canadian Medical Association. I'm Dr. Jillian Horton. I'm a general internist, writer, medical educator, and podcaster, and I'm your host for this series. We've always known that our jobs as physicians are uniquely stressful, but now we are anticipating clinical experiences that will surpass the highest levels of stress that the majority of us have ever faced. Furthermore, many have been or are considering self-isolating from our families and are cut off from normal sources of personal support. Our intention with this webinar is to explore and reframe our fear and our mindset as we prepare for an unprecedented clinical experience. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Robert Thursk, a physician who has the lived experience of long periods of isolation and of working in situations characterized by high personal risk. Dr. Thursk is a former astronaut with the Canadian Space Station, and he holds the Canadian record over 204 days of time spent in space. Dr. Thursk, thank you so much for joining us on the webinar today. Dr. Horton, it's my pleasure. So before we talk specifically about the challenges that doctors face around COVID-19, I'd like to ask you to set the stage. Can you tell us about the training that you went through to prepare for your mission, not just the technical training, but also the non-technical aspect of it? Well, in a nutshell, training for spaceflight, training for the astronaut career is like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, we all come into the astronaut program from a variety of professional backgrounds, uh, aviation, science, engineering, medicine, even recently uh, some astronauts have an educational background as well. And for the first uh, two or three years of astronaut training, we all raise our skills up to a common level of uh, a basic uh, understanding, knowledge and skills and attitudes that's required for spaceflight. So a physician astronaut is going to learn how to fly a high performance jet aircraft. And a pilot astronaut is gonna learn how to take a blood pressure and how to start an IV. So we all develop this, this common level of, um, of basic skills. And then the next few years are spent in advanced training. So we learn the technical skills. The technical skills for an astronaut are spacewalking, EVA we call it, um, robotics, rendezvous and docking procedures, and assembly and repair procedures as, as well. So that takes uh, many years, but uh, you also said uh, non-technical, and I'm so glad you said that because uh, some of these non-technical skills, uh, I think are just as important as the technical ones, especially for long duration space flight, especially for isolated and confined environments. So those skills we consider to be self-care, self-management, teamwork, group living, leadership, but also followership, and then the cross-cultural skills as, um, as well. If you're going to be living in an isolated and confined environment for a long time, in my case, it was six months, with international crewmates who represent a variety of nations, a variety of cultures, uh, problem-solving techniques, political ideologies, religious beliefs, it's important to have those uh, non-technical skills in, in abundance so that we can be an efficient, we can be a productive a crew and uh, we can uh, maintain our intra and our interpersonal relations. We talked yesterday about teams and some of the lessons that you've learned about teamwork in space. And so what aspects of team performance are we going to have to prioritize in order to get through the months ahead? Well, there's a, a number of things. You know, uh, a space mission is not too much different than uh, what we're undergoing here during the uh, COVID-19 uh, self-isolation that, uh, that we're doing here. We have a mission objective. Uh, we can consider ourselves as, um, as astronauts on, uh, on Spaceship Earth. And our mission objective right now is to minimize the infection rate so that uh, healthcare practitioners and patients around the world have a fighting chance against this, um, this nasty virus. Um, so there's a number of things that we need to do, social distancing, uh, of course, self-isolation, um, but uh, living at home with loved ones can be challenging. So there's a, a number of things. First of all, um, make sure that the living environment is, 
is good for everyone. Um, I have personality quirks. My wife reminds me of that all the time. And I have to be attentive, be aware of those quirks that can irritate people who are living in my face 24 hours uh, a day. And I'm willing to change my behavior so that the mission objectives during space flight or during a, uh, an infectious outbreak uh, can make the, the living environment pleasant uh, for everyone. On board the space station, uh, there are you know, the, the challenging tasks that we do. Robotics and spacewalking are probably the, the most challenging tasks that we do. But there's also the communal house taking, uh, housekeeping tasks that we do as well. They're not glamorous tasks. They're not heroic tasks, but they need to get done. And so we all need to take our turns changing out the, the human waste container that's part of the, the toilet system. It's not a scheduled activity. No one's going to ask you to do it, but you just realize uh, eventually it becomes uncomfortable to use the human waste facilities. So you just find, you know, 30 minutes in your, in your time and you go and, and, and do that change out. Taking care of the, the garbage, wiping down the, the walls, keeping the station tidy. Those are all tasks that um, are not scheduled, but we just know that we need to create a, uh, a thriving environment for all the crewmates. Same thing at home. Uh, there's a lot of unheroic tasks that uh, need to be done at, at, at home, cleaning up after after dinner, taking the garbage out to the uh, curb, mopping the floors, doing the dusting, especially during this time where we're all trying to accomplish this world mission objective. Take care of the small things um, at home as well. Uh, personal conflicts inevitably arise during the course of uh, every space mission. Thank God in, in my two missions, they were only minor issues, but it's important to um, address the elephant in the, in the room. Don't let these conflicts fester on without someone, you know, stepping forward and bringing everyone to gear, together. Air your expectations, communicate. Maybe the misunderstanding is uh, due to a cultural difference or to a, a, a Russian or English as a second language kind of uh, problem. So make sure that you communicate well and then, like a good marriage, com compromise. Uh, so I guess in, in general, it's uh, group living is be flexible and make sure that uh, you don't do things that uh, annoy other people. You know, if it's for the sake of the mission, I'll comb my hair the other way for six months. That's minor to me. I, what I want to do is I want to come home as a crew, uh, thriving, happy, healthy, and uh, having accomplished all of our mission objectives. I'll make small changes in in my behavior in order to uh, make sure that the, the crew thrives and that the mission is a success. So you mentioned something that I think is really important for us to talk about. And you know, as a physician, that the medical community has not always modeled quality self-care. And in fact, self-neglect has been a kind of touchstone for us. And I was sharing with you that I saw a post on social media about a well-intentioned resident in the United States who was saying he was coming for duty and he was staying on service until somebody forced him to go home. And I wonder if you could talk about why that classic physician attitude could actually impair our ability to respond as well as possible to this crisis. Well, when I arrived aboard the space station, I remember the first uh, dinner that we had that evening and my crew commander at the time, his name was Gennady Padalka from, from Russia. And he said uh, to me, Bob, you've flown in space before on the shuttle, correct? And I said, yes. And he said, what's the difference between a space station expedition and a shuttle flight? And I said, well, a space station, a uh, space shuttle flight is a sprint and a space station expedition is a marathon. And he said, that's close. A space shuttle mission is a short duration flight with a hectic, aggressive timeline. Space Station Expedition is a long duration flight with a hectic, aggressive timeline. <laughs> so <clears throat> he was just telling me what I was going to experience for the next uh, six months. It's going to be going, going, going every day. <clears throat> Gennady is a master of um, making sure that he uh, controls his workload and he always has reserves. In the course of every space mission, there's going to be contingencies. There's going to be something that goes wrong. Equipment is going to fail. Someone's going to get, get sick. Uh, there's going to be a, a crisis to, to deal with. And it's those astronauts who are not working at 100% who have the reserves to deal properly with the crises when they um, arise. You know, a lot of young people come up to me and they say, you know, I, I'd like to be a, a physician. I'd like to be a, an astronaut. 
um, what can I do? And first thing I tell them is to pace themselves. If you wish to soar with the eagles, to be a top astronaut, to be a, a top physician, then you need to take care of yourself first. Eat properly. You know, how many of us have grab, grabbed a, you know, a quick uh, calorie bar just to you know, get some calories in and then head back to the emergency room? You can't do that. You need to get in your, your uh, proper caloric intake, but in the fruits and the vegetables and the protein and, and that as well. Uh, get exercise every day. I religiously do an hour and a half of exercise every day. That's a, it's an hour and a half investment of my life, but uh, it pays off in, in big dip, dividends because I have endurance that exceeds most of my, my colleagues because I take that time for exercise. And then the same thing, thing is with sleep as, as well. Uh, make sure that uh, your body has enough time to recuperate uh, and be ready for the next day. We're all the same. We all have the same physiology. You're diluting yourself if you think that uh, you're a, a superwoman or a, or a superhuman and that you can do uh, an 18-hour shift in the emergency room or the ICU with no consequences, you're deluding yourself. If you wish to soar with the eagles, take care of your self-management. I want to talk for a moment about fear. So many of my friends and residents and colleagues have confided to me that they are afraid that they are going to acquire COVID-19 in the line of duty and that they're going to die. And specifically, many are afraid that they are going to acquire it because of inadequate personal protective equipment. Now, you and I spoke a little bit about fear yesterday as we prepared for our conversation. And I wonder if you could talk about some adaptive ways of working with fear in the context of a job where there is profound personal risk. Well, to be an astronaut is to take on risk and it's to live in um, a background of, of fear. Um, but I'm the kind of person, my astronaut colleagues are the kinds of people who think that the, the small chance of injury or death in this um, in this occupation, which is just finite, it's probably each flight has probably got a risk of, you know, less than one in a hundred um, of not coming back home. I've lost uh, seven dear friends uh, in a shuttle disaster, and I think that we've lost about eighteen astronauts and cosmonauts altogether over the half century period of uh, a human spaceflight. But I think that the the small chance of of risk in um, injury and death is small compared to the opportunities that I have to be get satisfyingly out of my comfort zone, to fulfill a childhood dream, a dream that I've had since, since grade three. The opportunity to test myself, not only intellectually, but test the limits of my being at my physical, my emotional limits uh, as well. Chance to bring pride to my country, the chance to represent my country on, on the world stage, the chance to work with the top individuals of the world and the top organizations like the Canadian Space Agency and, and NASA. Uh, for an astronaut, for me, those benefits greatly outweigh the, the small risks. Yeah, there's, there's risk in everything that we do in, in life. It's always risk versus um, benefit. So uh, what I do when I face fear is uh, I do the recalculation of risk versus benefits. And then another trait that I seem to have developed is some uh, trait called compartmentalization. What that means is that when you're sitting on a launch pad, you board your rocket, two million pounds of high explosive propellant below you, uh, could be the last thing that you do at, at liftoff. That's the most risky part of spaceflight. Is I'm focused on my on my task. I have a checklist. I have some duties that need to be performed during the eight and a half minutes of uh, ascent to um, to orbit, and my crew is relying on me to throw those switches properly, to inform them about uh, milestones that we've accomplished uh, along the way, to pull out the emergency procedure checklist if something goes wrong with the, the ascent and we have to return back to the ground. So I focus on, on the task, and that's the best thing that I can do, get rid of all those other distra distractions that uh, would cloud my ability to perform well and to um, be on top of my, of my game. So compartmentalization, focus on the task at hand, and that's uh, the best way that uh, I've developed to deal with my, my background fear. Now, I know that personal protective equipment is not the same as a spacesuit, but it still poses significant barriers to communication. 
So I wonder what advice you could give us on creating and maintaining the best possible communication when we're providing care in full PPE. That is one of the most original questions I've ever been asked. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, you're right. Uh, when we wear our um, flight suit to go outside the, the space station, it's a 100 kilogram space suit. It's got our life support system in there and it's got a rudimentary communication system as well. And you're right. When we, we listen to each other talk on um, uh, on the air to ground or the space to ground loops, uh, the quality is is not very good. Even on board uh, the space station, you know, just in our in our shorts and our T-shirts, it's hard to understand what some of our crewmates are saying, because in some places of the station, the noise level can be up to 70 dB. Um, we've got life support equipment that's running 24 seven. So pumps, compressors, motors, fans that are running all the time. And sometimes verbal communication is not the best way to communicate. So um, I'm just sort of thinking about some other ways to communicate. Um, you know, I guess you do a lot of pantomime in space. Uh, astronauts are good at with hand signals. We developed a number of hand signals that, that mean things to each other at, at, a, at a distance. We use uh, common terminology, so copy, concur, roger that, uh, words that are, that are expected. Uh, and then also, um, I probably have uh, one or two genes, <laughs> Mediterranean genes, some of our stereotypical um, Mediterranean um, colleagues uh, use their hands an awful lot. So using hands is a, is a good way to communicate as, uh, as well. Be a little bit like Marcel Marceau, and uh, that's a good way to communicate. And maybe the last thing is um, the smile on your face. Uh, that's important. That communicates that you're in control of, uh, of things that are, that are going on. Uh, when I review some of the, the videos and the images uh, from my past missions, all of the crewmates, we all have this big goofy uh, smile on our face. And um, it's because we were enjoying ourselves and we were communicating to each other that we were enjoying ourselves. So through the PPE, um, you know, make sure you use your other body language modalities to uh, let people know uh, and keep that smile on your face to let everyone know that you're, um, you're thriving and that you're in uh, control. As I hear you talk about that, I just find myself thinking about how easy it is for one teammate, one crewmate to bring everybody down if they're not engaging in that kind of behavior. Yeah, it's important um, to develop and to express uh, a positive approach uh, on orbit. That's one of the, the first things we learn in self-care, self-management. Uh, <clears throat> occasionally, there are times during our day when someone says something to you or makes a gesture and we interpret it the wrong way. And that bums us out for the, you know, the next hour or so. And the other person didn't intend that same meaning that you interpreted. Uh, it, again, it could be a uh, English as a second language problem or, or a cultural gesture that uh, was misinterpreted by, by my Canadian culture. So it's really important to, if you have any misunderstanding about what someone is communicating, with you, go and get clarification uh, on what they were saying. And in most cases, it's a miscommunication. It's it's better to maintain a positive outlook than to immediately jump to the, the negative outlook on, on uh, someone's uh, words or deeds. So Bob, we're almost out of time, but before we go, I know and you know that our colleagues are dealing with many complicated emotions right now. And you have seen this planet from the window of the space station. You lost friends when Columbia exploded. And you have a perspective that I think pits mortality and risk against timelessness. So we're part of an historic event in medicine right now. What final thoughts do you want to leave with us as we enter into our mission? You know, space flight is not just a professional experience. Um, it's also a personal experience. So we do have professional mission objectives to accomplish, robotics objectives or, or assembly objectives. But uh, being up there for six months with the opportunity to work in an international setting with other crewmates, other organizations, and to look out the window at this beautiful planet down below. You know, the first few days that I was up there in orbit, whenever my hometown in Canada passed by underneath, I'd call a crewmate over and say, hey, look, that's, that's my hometown down there. But after, you know, a, a few days, that didn't seem important to me. I became aware of my home continent. And then maybe after two or three weeks up there, all I saw was just one humanity. I didn't, I'm proud to be Canadian, but I just felt 
uh, primarily to be a citizen of planet Earth. From uh, the orbital perspective, we see that everything is one, everything is connected. When I say connected, I, I mean that, you know, not just uh, geological, geologically or or meteorologically, uh, that there's a forest fire in Siberia. Sometimes you see the smoky pall from that forest fire rise up, pass all the way across the uh, Pacific Ocean and uh, impact the quality of air in uh, North America. Same thing, you can see a, a small uh, weather depression start in the South Atlantic and then migrate up northwards and develop into a category four hurricane and impact the, the lives of those people that live along the, the Texas Gulf Coast. So you can really see that our natural ecosystem, the air, the land, the oceans, the flora, the fauna, they're all connected. And when something happens in one part of the world, there's going to be a repercussion uh, somewhere where else. And that's that's the way the human body works, of course. You know, um, if you have uh, a patient whose uh, beta cells are not not working very well, very well it can have a, an impact on on their vision, on their central nervous system, on the cardiac system, on the on the renal system, all because one tiny tiny group of cells no longer produces insulin. At individual level, there's a myriad of interconnections that that control this this human system, and on the world planetary level as well. There's a myriad of interconnections that control viral infections, but also the world economy. And um, what became most apparent to me is that a lot of the issues that I sort of focused on prior to flight, you know, Canadian Parliament, uh, my community uh, activities, were less important. And the big problems are survival of the human species. And those are dependent on overpopulation, poverty, inequality, environmental damage. And when you look out the window from the orbital vantage point of the International Space Station, that seems so clear. I, I wish that everyone on the planet had the opportunity to go up to space and just look out the window for three days. Don't do anything. Just look out the window for three days. And uh, I think that would give us a new perspective on what civilization is all about, what humanity is all about and um, the promise of international collaboration. That's that's uh, how spaceflight changed me at the personal level. And it sounds like I can extrapolate from that by assuming that after we get through this event, as horrible as it already is and as challenging as it is gonna be, there may be advantages in the new perspective that we are going to have about both medicine and how we fit into the bigger picture. Now, that's another trait that you've um, touched on. Uh, one of the practices that I've incorporated into my life following my space career is debriefing everything. Um, everything that I've done, I've learned lessons from. When I returned from a training session, I spent a half hour debriefing my performance. Some things went well, some things didn't go so well, but it's an opportunity for me to improve. After every mission, again, as I said, there's no, been no perfect mission that's ever been flown. But there are weeks worth of debriefs that we uh, uh, allow us to recount to other astronauts who will follow us, flight controllers, instructors, that we can take our game to higher and higher levels. Yeah, the COVID-19 uh, uh, world phenomenon is unprecedented. We've never seen something of this scale before. Uh, it would be, um, it behooves us to sit and debrief all aspects of it. And um, we weren't quite ready for the COVID-19 outbreak, it took us by surprise. The magnitude of it, of it took us by surprise. But another one is gonna come in the decades that, that follow. And uh, we'll be ready for, um, for that one. Well, I wanna end by thanking you for sharing your experience with us today and for helping us all to see things just a little bit differently. If you can handle 204 days in outer space, I know that we can do physical distancing for as long as it takes to save lives. Yeah, we have mission objectives, Jillian, and um, each crew member can affect the quality of life on uh, on our spaceship, planet Earth. So uh, let's follow those um, self-isolation measures. Thanks to everyone. All of my friends out there are on the front lines as healthcare practitioners under this, um, this uh, tough mission. I uh, respect you and wish you strength and health. Well, thank you so much. I've been speaking with physician and astronaut, Dr. Robert Thirsk. I'm Dr. Jillian Horton. Thank you for joining us for the second installment of our COVID-19 webinar series powered by Juul. 
Take care of yourselves. Thank you for all that you do. And I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.